Today's uh, presentation is on stronger animal uh, protection laws benefit everyone. The overview of today's presentation will be looking at a few different areas, looking at animal, pro animal protection laws throughout history to today, some psychosocial and mental health and jurisprudence links, uh, and followed by benefits on stricter, of, of stricter laws on the environment and public health. Start with uh, a quote by Pythagoras, um, a Greek philosopher, and will share with us the privilege of having a soul. A link to Origins of Western Thought by a couple of ancient Greek philosophers. Uh, firstly, by uh, Hippocrates, uh, father of uh, medicine. Uh, the soul is the same in all living creatures, although the body of each is different. Uh, and from Pythagoras, as long as men massacre animals, they will kill each other. Just to give a bit of an overview outside of uh, Western thought and um, and uh, philosophy, uh, religious and cultural perspectives globally, we see different attitudes um, from across the globe regarding uh, sentient beings, non-human animals. We see this with Buddhism. We see this with aspects of uh, Hinduism and Jainism. Um, we also see this in uh, certain aspects of Christianity and other monotheistic religions in regard to particularly take a uh, um, um, Sorry, hermeneutic uh, approach to interpreting the texts. Recent history and towards civilization, uh, just to show the conjunctive uh, uh, evolution of uh, animal welfare and animal protection laws with um, human uh, welfare laws. Uh, early examples of movements for the welfare of animals were conjunctive with the anti slave trade lobby, uh, beginning in the 18th century. Examples like the RSPCA were founded, uh, co-founded by early abolitionists of the slave trade in 1824. Uh, so very early uh, laws that were uh, introduced in 1635, we see in Ireland a law passed uh, banning with pulling wool from sheep, a live sheep as opposed to clipping. We see in uh, the colony of Massachusetts at the time, uh, law any tyranny or cruelty toward any creature usually kept on man's use. And in 1822, we saw a ban, a law in the UK banning cruel marine proper treatment of cattle. In 1911, we saw the Protection of Animals Act passed by the UK Parliament. Just to give a bit of an over, uh, oversight and uh, uh, backdrop to uh, laws. Uh, UK Parliament in uh, 2022, last year, uh, introduced a, uh, a bill which is passing legislation recognising animal sentience, including even uh, creatures like small invertebrates, like uh, sea creatures. Um, there are other examples on a constitutional level, in uh, 2019, the High Court of Punjab and Haryana in India recognised non-human animals as legal entities when a proposal to alter the constitution to include animals was made. Uh, in 2020, the Islamabad High Court of Pakistan recognised animals as having natural rights. And in 2020, in Ecuador, a habeas court was cased on behalf of an animal illegally confined was accepted by Ecuador's, Ecuador's constitutional court in line with constitutional rights of nature. Um, and this was as part of our international jurisprudence regarding ecosystem rights, um, which is, yeah, an, another example of that. Uh, just to make a, a bit of a, a cl some clarity here, aside from um, the political or ideological or semantic use of uh, rights versus welfare in the rights in a legal constitutional context, uh, afford more protections and less loopholes, uh, simply to human rights. Um, despite this, many uh, animal welfare laws have improved standards as, and opposed blatant examples of cruelty, uh, similarly to how many uh, exa uh, examples of the abolition of uh, torture uh, actually did precede the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, just to give some examples of um, bans of blatant cruelty, uh, twannels, got uh, practices like the forced feeding of geese have been banned in many countries where it had been previously consumed uh, and imported in many cases, uh, like export, has been banned or uh, proposed to be banned in many countries, uh, including New Zealand, where it has been banned. Uh, things like uh, crustaceans, uh, uh, treatment for, for killing crustaceans in, has been banned in uh, certain practices in Bambi, Switzerland, Northern Italy, and advised against by the RSPCA. So just to give a few examples. So um, just highlight the corresponding uh, sort of overlap with when we look at a, a map here of the uh, Civil Liberties Index by country, just, just from, this is the Economist Intelligence Unit, which is one review, 
um, of how companies can be ranked in terms of uh, suitable liberties. Obviously, there's a, there's a whole range of different areas. Um, but there are some corresponding trends to when looking at uh, different animal welfare indexes. As we can see here, there are a few countries where there is this corresponding similarity and a few countries where um, the poorer uh, standards of treatment of animals do correspond with uh, lower um, indexes for people and civil liberties. When we uh, look at it, uh, just extrapolating that further and into a, uh, a psychosocial level and just looking um, through a number of different studies, studies have shown that people who are more empathetic towards animals are more empathetic towards people. Um, it demonstrates uh, that and there's also been a number of studies that demonstrate that standards produce that um, teaching children to have empathy for animals has better mental health, health outcomes later in life. It has the capacity to, to produce better standards uh, within society later on, on a social level. Uh, in just another example, uh, in cases of children who witness intimate partner violence in the home, when this, uh, obviously that can result in mental health issues later on in life, when this is coupled with witnessing animal cruelty, as studies have shown, the mental health impacts later in life are magnified and more severe and harder to uh, deal with, which is an interesting uh, point. In legal cases, uh, many um, outcomes of cost custody disputes regarding children are swayed by the presence of animal cruelty. Uh, when presented to court, court orders concerning animal welfare and pet protection are also prevalent in family and domestic violence cases. There's some researchers in Australia proposing that animals be seen as victims of domestic violence. I just uh, expanding that further with a criminology perspective. Um, there's been for many decades a, um, a link um, promoted between, um, discussed between animal cruelty and violence towards people. And this has been demonstrated for, uh, within many studies when whilst at times this has been contested and questioned, uh, some very uh, simple facts remain. Uh, people who have abused an animal are five times more likely to be violent towards people. But according to one study, another study shows that animal cruelty is disproportionately present in cases involving child abuse, partner abuse, and sibling abuse. Uh, children who have committed animal cruelty are twice as likely to have experienced serious abuse. From a psychiatric viewpoint, animal cruelty has been considered a symptom of conduct disorder since the 1980s. Uh, the links between animal cruelty and criminality and interpersonal violence and abuse is significant. Uh, this demonstrates the incentives on a, on a social level to ensure and stricter laws concerning you know, property. Now, just to uh, where this can intersect with other aspects of sustainability, yeah, uh, and uh, environmental protection and so forth, often uh, veganism, that may start to discuss, you know, is obviously an overlap with interest for animal welfare, animal protection laws. So just to look at this now. Um, some of the, uh, if we look at the ways in which animal, uh, strong, stronger animal welfare or animal protection laws can link, obviously, um, animal agriculture and use of animals for food and commodities has a large, a huge impact upon the environment. This can be seen in the seafood industry, livestock grazing and factory farming. Uh, animal agriculture is the largest driver, largest single driver of deforestation on the planet, partly through grazing livestock and 41% of all global deforestations by beef alone and through growing feed for factory farm animals. Now, 75% of tropical deforestation is caused by beef, soy, which is mostly uh, grown for animal feed, also alongside, to a lesser extent, palm oil and paper. Our seafood industry, or deep-sea trawlers, are the number one cause of damage to the ocean floor and seabed habitats, uh, ahead of all other causes, uh, including offshore mining. Uh, just in lower, and our statistic, um, yeah, 70, in a recent study, 75 to 86 percent of buoyant debris within the Pacific garbage patch was found to be from discarded fishing gear from China, South Korea, and Japan. That's a, a study from last year. Um, the targeting of uh, this is a, obviously a, a well known uh, issue the targeting of higher tropic species of fish or the larger uh, predatory uh, species of fish as part of the seafood industry's focus generally has resulted in incre uh, increased lower tropic species of fish uh, who then consume more zooplankton and phytoplankton, resulting in decreased uh, carbon sequestration. Um, you know, you can see the obvious issues there um, with the ocean being the largest uh, carbon sink. 
uh, the, the impacts upon the climate of animal agriculture through greenhouse gas emissions are currently the third largest cause uh, after uh, oil and gas is projected by one study to overtake oil and gas within 30 years if left uh, unmitigated. Um, according to one study from last year, uh, in a, uh, the, rapid, uh, the proposed rapid phase-out of animal agriculture has the capacity to reduce greenhouse gas, gas emissions to 50% of what they need to be by the end of the century. And this is actually achievable without any oil and gas reduction. So even if we weren't going to be uh, converting to renewables uh, instead of uh, uh, oil and gas, this would already alone reduce uh, emissions to 50% of what they need to be. Our previous studies only have considered the ongoing impact of greenhouse gases from animal agriculture and not the historical impact of land conversion and the regenerating impact of rapid phase out due to, you know, through reforestation and the increasing of carbon sinks. Uh, this is partly due to the fact that methane and nitrous oxide as caused by animal agriculture have much lower lifespan in the atmosphere, so re regeneration um, on an atmospheric level is, is more easily achieved as well. Uh, whilst livestock grazing has a huge impact on biodiversity, as do fishing trawlers, another cause of agricultural expansion is crops to feed that trick on livestock. Um, and this is where it obviously intersects further with uh, uh, stronger animal protection laws. Uh, factory farming therefore doesn't only impact on animal suffering, whereby animals are kept in unnatural conditions, but this has a huge impact upon biodiversity loss, with animal agriculture having a disproportionate impact on biodiversity broadly. Waste runoffs and contamination from factory farming have a huge impact on biodiversity, uh, magnifying the impact of deforestation for animal feed, as well as excessive uh, water usage for confined animals. So, if we talk about, um, as you know, many people within society will consider the unnatural way in which uh, factory farming is operating, uh, by eradicating factory farming or reducing the, the conditions or eliminating the conditions that most livestock are subjected to by stronger animal protection laws, we can significantly also therefore reduce climate change and biodiversity loss. Um, by reducing animal consumption in totality, as many uh, sustainability proponents have advocated, and converting to plant-based uh, produce, uh, biodiversity loss and can uh, land conversion through grazing livestock is prevented even further. Uh, projections of effects upon, uh, effects upon uh, GDP in the United States, in one study, demonstrated that an overall neutral impact was, was what could be witnessed. Uh, for producers, minor long-term gains are projected to mitigate any sh minor short-term losses, which are relatively neutral, which, as one study proposed, which governments should assist with. And uh, as another study suggested, producers require incentivization and guidance and direction by policymakers. Uh, so it really is up to governments to, 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 to initiate uh, this and be more proactive if they're to take it seriously. Um, another major issue concerning factory, factory farming or intensive animal farming in particular is the impact of zoonotic diseases and antibiotic resistance, which there's a uh, huge um, expenditure poured into research to counteract whilst um, the conditions enabling it continue. Uh, zoonosis, which are linked to intensive animal agriculture, pose a huge threat to public health and the potential of future, pandem future pandemics. The lack of public uh, awareness, uh, according to one study, the lack of public awareness of the leap between zoonotic disease and intensive animal agriculture is of concern. Uh, whilst COVID had popular attention of potentially being linked to wet markets in the media, uh, this is not broadly understood. Uh, it's not broadly understood in regard to um, zoonotic diseases in general and just how linked the two things are. Uh, by eliminating intensive animal agriculture, including wet markets and, and, and the conditions in those um, areas, uh, this ongoing threat is significantly decreased, according to one study. Uh, intensive animal farming, whether on land or in water in fish farms, also pose a huge threat to the anti antibiotics with antibiotic resistance a constant threat, again, which huge, huge uh, sums of money have been poured into uh, trying to counteract. 70% uh, of the primary anti antibiotics used for humans are given to livestock to stave off infections, but also at low doses to facil facilitate growth of livestock by suppressing gut bacteria, as historically in the last 20 years 
been the case. Uh, this can result in a crisis causing if there were antibody resistance was to uh, get out of control in a crisis causing 10 million deaths a year, according to one study. Uh, the same study uh, estimated that the United States alone, um, as of 2016, spent uh, 20, million, 20 billion per year in addressing first line antibody resistance. This is projected to increase to, um, given the potential threats to a cumulative of 100 trillion by 2050. So uh, different approaches already taken. Uh, yeah, um, organizations like the Good Food Institute seek to globally convert existing supply chains and business models of meat and livestock industry, but instead utilize plant-based and cell-based meat, so from yeah, animal cells, through technological innovations, which mitigates the obviously all the um, threats to biodiversity, the threats to uh, climate, uh, the environment broadly, and to public health. Uh, people still have the meat that they love, but uh, uh, it's produced in a more green way. Um, approaches to address commercial, legal, and governmental drawbacks are taken by this organisation. Uh, the approach taken uh, in this way is that culture and convenience can remain, but huge impacts upon public health and environment, as, as mentioned, um, are prevented. Uh, coupled with such approaches and uh, psychosocial-based impacts of seeing animals as sentient beings in law and with rights, as many constitutions have been called on at least to recognise, this could have benefits for society as well as the environment. In having stronger animal protection laws, uh, this can link to this. This is where this links to the tri framework. Um, yeah, it links to areas such as systems thinking, uh, strong sustainability, and finite resources uh, by strengthening uh, animal protection laws to ensure animals have rights. Therefore, uh, uh, in, in the, therefore ending exploitative conditions. This has the added impact of decreasing biodiversity loss and climate change, and allows regeneration to occur. Along and I'm. Um, yeah, from you for alongside um, animal and animal friendly eco friendly industries, which is in line with our strong sustainability. Uh, by ending the most immediate examples of animal cruelty, such as in factory farming, more intensive farming in wet markets, zoonotic diseases, as well as threats such as antibiotic resistance, are decreased significantly, and the expenditure required to combat this uh, are also decreased. Uh, just again, uh, yeah, United Nations SDGs, stronger animal welfare laws, similarly have an impact on multiple SDGs, including life on land, life below water, climate action, responsible, responsible production and consumption, and good health and well-being. Uh, and closing remarks, yeah, if we want to, uh, if, we, if we want our world to be thriving, we need to ensure adequate, adequate protections of non-human animals as well as part of this which has the result of benefiting public health, mental health, and the environment. Thank you all for coming.